morning and welcome to Hillside. I am so glad that you guys are joining us today. If you haven't joined us before, I'm Megan and um, welcome to Children's Ministry time. So <coughs> last week we had talked about Paul and his final days on earth. So his hope was rooted in Jesus Christ and who he was the author and finisher of his faith and our faith. Paul said to Timothy, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept my heart full of faith. And he was executed for that faith by the emperor. After that, um, the Bible doesn't end with just Paul's letters, but we move into the letters by Apostle John. So John was in exile on the island of Patmos, and this was during a very intense time of persecution by the Roman Empire. The emperor at that time wanted to be called the Lord God and be worshipped by all. And Christians could not and would not do that. So because they worshiped the one true God, they refused to worship the emperor. And they were often put in prison, punished, or most likely killed for their faith. And that is why John was exiled. So he was the only original 12 that was left. All had been martyred for their faith in one form or another. And Paul, he, um, like Paul's death, the faith was spread like good seed falling on good soil when uh, the different martyrs happened. It encouraged the Christians to remain strong and that there was a finish to this race, as Paul had said to Timothy. While in Patmos, John had heard the struggles of many of the different churches that he had taught at and preached at. And because of the martyrs, there was a lack of teachers that had seen Jesus face to face and knew Jesus and knew the good message. So John wrote to these churches letters of instruction, much like a parent writes to a child or teaches a child. So John warned them first off that there are false teachers who are saying that Jesus is either just human and not God, or just God and couldn't be human. John explained that Jesus was fully human and fully God. John had heard Jesus' heart beat, and he knew that Jesus was the Son of God when he saw him on the Mount of Transfiguration, and where he saw Christ in his deity. So in these letters, John reminds the church to stay faithful to what they believe. The key ideas that he talks about come from the message in the last few chapters of his gospel. The first being God is light. So we are called to walk in the light by following Jesus' commands. That can be hard to do, but that is why we have the redeeming love of Christ, sacrifice on the cross. It's not a free pass to go and disobey or be hurtful, but it's his grace that we have when we fall short to continue to get back up and continue to love one another in Christ following his commands. The darkness of this world, which is sin, is passing away. That means we, as God's children, are, who are in the light, have victory over sin and darkness now. Light overwhelms the darkness. You don't go in, into your room and be like, oh, it's too dark, nothing's going to work. You turn on the light switch and you're like, look, there's no dark. It's all light. The dark can't overcome the light. So when we know this truth of Jesus and that Jesus is God, by believing in him, we are God's children. And the world sees us as God's children when we walk in the light by loving others. The second key idea in 1 John is God is love. As children, we're called to love one another instead of hating our brothers and sisters. An example of this would be Cain in Genesis 4. He didn't love Abel. He hated Abel, and you know what happened. It wasn't very good. Love is defined for us when we look at the cross. Jesus gave up his life before he would do anything else for us because he loved us so much. We need to trust in God's love. And John warns against false teachers again who speak out against Jesus, which is a warning for us that if they're not saying what aligns with what God has already told us in the scriptures, don't listen to them. And if you're confused about what someone's saying, ask your parents or one of your teachers here at church. We would love to help with any of those questions. So as we live our life centered on God's love, which is the true giving love, a love that wins over fear, we reflect that love, much like a mirror will reflect your image. In God's love, we have victory over sin through trusting in the crucified Jesus. We trust in God's testimony and the apostles' testimony given through the Holy Spirit, which is the word of God, that Jesus is God, and through him we have eternal life. Now, second and third John are more direct to different churches. He tells them not to offer any support or place for the deceivers or the false teachers. And secondly, he encourages them to welcome genuine teachers and missionaries. 
So there's one more book we're going to look at. It's the last book of the Bible, Revelation. Now, I'm not going to try and do a big, great teaching like Pastor Steve. That was phenomenal. If you want more information, look up that teaching from Pastor Steve. I'm just going to look at the hope that Paul or John gave us in that book. So John, he received visions while on the island of Patmos and wrote 22 chapters of prophecy. Now, John had seen Jesus. He'd walked closely with him. He knew him. But when he saw Jesus in his eternal, exalted state, John fainted. It was so overwhelming how Jesus appeared to John. So after he came to, Jesus told him to write down almost everything that he saw. So the book does, a lot of people say, oh, it's all about this persecution and this horrible end, and it should be fearful. But it's not. At the end of that persecution, we see believers are called to remain faithful to the end of time, to Christ. The most exciting passage of scripture happens after all of this persecution. Our victorious Jesus returns on a white horse in all of his majesty and strength. And Satan's judged and defeated, and we are made new in Christ that we are able to reign with him and have our promise fulfilled, that hope that we have. Jesus gives a promise at the very end, saying, Behold, I am coming soon. And Revelation was written to encourage the believers, then and now, to stand strong in Christ, for there is an eternal reward for us coming soon. Just like Paul said, I have finished the fight, I have run the good race, there's a crown of righteousness waiting for me. That's the reward. So, in Christ's return, we see a fulfillment that we are victorious over the sin that started way back in Genesis with Adam and Eve. And sin, so that really separates us from God. So revelation could be scary for a sinner. And before you accept Jesus into your heart, you have what looks like a dirty rag. I don't have an example of that, but we disobey or do bad things. We're sinning. So when we confess our sins, Jesus turns our heart into a clean, clean heart and gives us a new um, new robes instead of dirty rags. So I have an example for you. I have a glass of water, which represents God, and a rock, which represents us. Now sin, this will be the paper, separates the rock from the water, much like our sin will separate us from God. But when we pray for Jesus to forgive our sins, they're taken away, and we're no longer separated from Christ. We're completely overwhelmed by God. So this is why a believer can stand in confidence and say, as John did, come, Jesus, come. No one knows when the Lord will come back, but we are to watch and wait and pray and be ready for his coming. But until he comes, we're not to sit around. We have work to do. Jesus told us to tell everyone the good news and the way to heaven. So kids, your challenge this week is to pray for your friends that haven't heard the word of God and haven't heard this wonderful salvation story that they will have softened hearts, but also for you that you'll be praying for yourself, that you'll be bold, that when it comes time for you to share this message, you'll be ready to do it. So I just want to pray for you guys this morning. Lord, I thank you for our children and for the boldness you've already given them. I ask that you continue just to fill their lives with you and as they continue to grow deeper in you and learn more, that they'll just be so excited that they'll share it with anyone who will listen and even those who won't listen, that they'll continue just to speak up for you. We thank you for these kids and we thank you for the morning you've given them. Amen. Thank you, Megan. I don't know if you caught that, by the way, but she just went through 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John and the book of Revelation in like eight minutes. That's incredible. So if you're, if you're home, I would say give her a round of applause because that is not an easy feat. Thank you, Megan, for doing that. Thank you for continuing to pour into our kids at this time. Um, and I just, I hear the Spirit of the Lord saying that your sacrifice is worth it, that Paul's sacrifice for the gospel was worth it, and that the sacrifice of those that lay down their lives that we remember today for on Memorial Day is worth it, and that the sacrifice of laying down your life to follow Jesus is worth it. We're going to talk more about that in a little bit. Uh, we're going to get started in, in, in three minutes at 10 o'clock, but I want to encourage you, if you're home, go grab a glass of water, go grab your Bible and a journal and invite someone to come join us for, for church today. Tell them they don't even have to leave wherever they are. They can just join right online, and we'll see you in just a few minutes, friends.
a lot of chaos and confusion going on, it's so easy to get swept up with all the angst in our society, with all the ways that we feel like we've been wronged in this moment. And yet the way of Jesus is that he lays those things down. And that victory comes when we lay those things down and find what he's doing in it. One of, uh, one of the members of the worship team just shared about this passage in 2 Corinthians about demolishing strongholds, not by our own might, but by through prayer and through believing in what the Lord's going to do. And they shared, it's, I've been able to take every thought captive, and I've been able to sleep at night. And I believe that God wants to give us this supernatural peace above what makes sense for the situation. God wants to give us peace over anxiety and even see what he's doing. And they even shared that sometimes we can build scenarios in our head that haven't even happened yet. Have you been guilty of that? Like you project into the future, this is what it's going to be like. And uh, sometimes it's, it's not good, the things we project. And instead, Jesus offers that we can take every thought captive. And I believe that the Lord wants to shift our perspective this morning to see that his arm is not too short to save us. He is more than able to save whatever is going on in our life. Last week, Todd preached out of the story with um, Peter being called out of the boat, and he reminded us that Jesus reached out to him and grabbed him. And I feel like the Lord wants to do that with us today, is to reach out and grab and, and offer his hand to us, and that he is mighty to save. And in that, we can exchange our life for his life, and it's the best life we can ever have. So would you join us for worship wherever you are at home? If you're out fishing today, whatever you do, whatever you're doing, will you join us as we magnify the God who is great, the God who is above all things, the God who created everything from nothing? We're going to lift him up in our hearts this morning.
thank you, Lord, that your word tells us to declare your praises. And I thank you, Lord, that we can bless you. We can tell our soul, I will bless the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Oh, Lord, we just, we lift our eyes up. If they're not already looking at you, just lay aside those things that can entangle us so easily.
just thank you for the beautiful things that you make out of what seems like it will only do harm. I thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are so mighty. You are so above it all that you can take even the things that the enemy intended to tear apart and to divide. You take them and you send him running because you use them for your good. And Lord, I just pray that we are people. God, when we are crushed, when we are, when we feel pressed, Lord, we thank you that your word tells us that we're not destroyed. You don't leave us, Lord, but instead you make beautiful things. And we just thank you for that, Lord. We just surrender. We surrender to your ways. We surrender to your process, God. Oh, Lord, search our hearts, and when we are pressed, Lord, let what comes out of us be good and, and be beauty and be praise and worship surrendered to you, Lord.
love you and, and we don't want to just strive in our own human strength, even with the own, our own ideas of what we think our lives should look like. And I'm not talking about the dreams that God has placed in your heart, but sometimes we so attach ourselves to the details of what we think it should look like that we can miss the heart of what God's trying to do. And so, Lord, we just surrender, even though it's so difficult sometimes, most of the time, we surrender our ideas and our expectations. And we ask you just to take them and, and, and our expectation and our anticipation would be for your glory, for your power, for your love to move. And Lord, we lay our dreams, the ones you've given us, Lord, we surrender them to you. And we surrender them to you so that you can come and complete them and work on them in your way. God, I just pray if there's anything in our minds and hearts that are holding us back from you, I just pray that they would fall, that they would just, they would just be crushed to pieces because we only want exactly what you have for us, God. There is only complete joy in you, Jesus, and in walking in your will for our lives, and we just thank you for that.
sets the crooked things straight and he makes rivers and wastelands and dry lands and deserts that's impossible but he does it and with him all things are possible Lord I thank you that you speak things into being and you call things that we can't even see and you call them into being. And we just open up our hearts. Lord, this is so much bigger than just our own lives before you. This is your heart and what you want to do for your people, all of your people, all of your creation. You created each and every one of us. Even those who've turned their back on And Lord, we just ask that we could be a part of this amazing thing that you're doing. Come and move in this earth. Come and move in us, Lord. I just felt the Lord speak to me so strongly as we were singing. Show us your glory and in I just felt like it was personal to me. And then as we continued singing, I just felt to share it. I've always desired to see God move in my life, but I just felt the Lord saying, do you really want it? Do you really want all of my glory in your life? You're gonna have to lay down what you thought it would look like. I just felt that for more than me and it's not that he's not it's not that he's going to do something less than it's that he's going to do something even greater and our limits and the things that we put in our brains they can just hold him back because we can say in essence God you can you can come this far 
you can deal with this part of my heart. You can come this far, but you can't come all the way. And I just feel the Lord asking us, and I feel like it's just, it's bigger. It's bigger than my heart. It's bigger than than this building. It's bigger than this town. It's, it's, it's a, a, a huge movement that the Lord wants to do. You know, he's the same yesterday and today and forever, but he's always doing something fresh by the power of his Holy Spirit. And I feel the Lord asking us, do you really want to see my glory? Do you really want to see what I want to come and do? And so, Lord, we do. We want to see your glory. We want to we wanna lay down anything that would keep us from, from everything that you have for us. Lord, open up our hearts. Thank you, Jesus. You know, there's such power in, in fire. You know, there's power in the glory of the Lord. We, 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 think, we think of the Holy Spirit coming with fire. You know, he, he came in Acts 2 with fire on each one, and, and fire has just amazing properties, but it burns up anything that can't stand in its heat. Lord, we pray that you come and you'd burn away any chaff, any, anything in our hearts and our lives that's not of you. You know, in any, any small fire in our hearts, that, that fire is going to come. And anything that's good and is of the Lord and of his fire, his passion, it's just going to make it burn brighter. It's going to make it burn brighter. Lord, you're just doing a huge sifting of your people. And it's mighty. It's mighty. Lord, you've come. You've allowed just things to be shaken. And we don't need to be afraid, you know, because you want to bring your glory. You're shaking things so that anything that's not of you cannot remain. And we stand in your glory. And we want all of you, Jesus. All of you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We just want, I just want to close with this chorus that we had planned because I just feel in my heart that we, we don't want to build our lives on ideals on, on, on concepts contrary to the word of God. We want to build our lives on Jesus himself. He is the cornerstone. Rejected by many, but Lord, we receive you. You came, you came in a mysterious way and those whose hearts were open to you were able to receive and we want to hear your voice. We don't want to be like those Pharisees who had read your word and had it memorized but couldn't recognize you when you were right there in front of them, the living Son of God, the fulfillment of years and years of prophecy, and you are alive. And we have so many promises in your word that have yet to be fulfilled, and we get to be a part of them, and we thank you for that, Lord. We won't build our lives on sinking sand, on shifting sand, on, on building materials that are made with our own hands. But we want to live with a foundation and every single part of that building that is built by you. The way you created this world, you spoke it, and then you said it was good. Lord, come and do it, Father. And to your people, God, you created Adam and you were holding him in your hands, the form of him, and then you breathed your mighty spirit into him, Lord. We need your spirit, God. I will.
Father, thank you. Thank you that we have the joy of laying everything down. God, we lay down our ambitions. We lay down our pride. We lay down our dreams for our life. And in exchange, God, you give us yours. And Lord, there's so much joy in laying that down. There's so much joy in laying down the things that we want. And so we, we lay down striving today. We, we lay our ambitions and the things that we've run after at the foot of the cross, God. Thank you, Lord, for the, for the exchange that you give us when we lay that down, the peace that we have, the joy that we have in following you instead of our own ambitions. I'm reminded of what Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 2. He said, thanks be to God who always leads us as captives in Christ's triumphal procession and uses us to spread the aroma of the knowledge of him everywhere. It's this picture of a victory parade, and Jesus is the one who's won the victory, and we're swept up in it, not as the ones who have won the victory ourselves, but we're, we're part of the bounty that Christ has won. And so it's, it's in our willingness to, to follow him at every cost and at any cost that we find the victory Jesus has for us. And I felt like I heard the Lord say this morning, especially after our children's ministry time, talking about the Apostle Paul and laying down his life, I felt like the Lord is saying that your sacrifice is worth it. Your sacrifice of obeying God, no matter the cost, is worth it. Your sacrifice of laying everything down is going to be worth it. So I don't know where you are in the middle of that time. If you're in the middle of laying something down, if you already have, or if God is calling you to lay something down, but know that it's worth it. And just like this weekend, we remember those in our country that gave their life, they gave the ultimate sacrifice for freedom. I bet that if we could ask them, they would say that it was worth it. Christ laid down his life for us so that we can find freedom, and he invites us to lay our life down so that we can find the life he has for us. It's the best life that there is. So Jesus, thank you for speaking so clearly to us already this morning. We're so excited for what you have. We don't say that flippantly, God. We know the sacrifice that that comes with of following you at any cost. But Lord, the life with you is so much better than hanging on to our own dreams, our own ambitions, the things that we want, God. We, we want you and not those other things, Lord. Amen. Amen. I've got a couple of announcements for you. Um, and the first thing is that I'm really excited to share with you the, the plan that the Lord gave the elders regarding our reopening here at Hillside Christian Fellowship. Yeah. We're so excited to tell you about it. So uh, I want you to know that the elders have continued praying and seeking Jesus' face for direction, hope, and guidance. By the way, I'm just going to read you a letter because there's a lot to it, and I don't want to miss say anything. Uh, if you're on our email list, you're going to get this in a little over an hour. It's coming out to you. But I want to read this to you from the heart of the elders. So we've been continuing to pray and seek Jesus' face for direction, hope, and guidance during this time. And we know, we really know that God doesn't want us to sit idly by in this moment, but to be faithful stewards of all that Jesus is doing in our midst. And so we want to share with you the plan the Lord has given us for the, this next season of corporate worship. And uh, the date that we picked to open, we didn't pick based off of any anyone's orders, but we really felt as elders like the Lord was calling Hillside to a 21-day fast to get our hearts focused on Him and on one another and to see uh, God move in the middle of this COVID epidemic. So the Lord has led us to opening on June 7th. Sunday, June 7th is going to be the first time we're back together for worship. So excited about that. So excited for you to be back. And I just want to tell you that we feel like the Lord is leading us to offer three different options for worship each Sunday. The first is worship here in the sanctuary, and we're going to gather right in here. During this time, there won't be Unfortunately, there won't be any children's ministry or nursery or cafe fellowship, um, but we're doing that so that we can be together in a safe way. Our greeters are going to help usher people in and out of the sanctuary in an effort to maintain social distancing. Our team of ushers and deacons and greeters, we're going to wear masks for the benefit of you, uh, but we're not going to mandate that you wear masks. They're recommended, but they, you don't have to wear one to join us. So that's the first one, is worship here in the sanctuary with us. The second option is that you can worship with us in the parking lot. We have an FM transmitter. By the way, Todd bought this years ago as a, as a way to help someone in our church body who was hard of hearing, and now churches everywhere are scrambling trying to find this FM transmitter. We could probably sell it for a decent profit if we wanted to. But we're not going to do that. So you can pull in the parking lot and you can join us for worship uh, on the radio on FM 93.1. 
don't feel like you have to memorize that. We'll tell you what it is. And you can stay in your vehicle. Some families may want to come in the sanctuary for worship and then head on out to their car for the remainder of the sermon. Know that you're welcome to do that. Megan and our children's ministry will have some different things that they can do in the car while that's happening at for either in the car or also in the room. And then the third option is that you can continue to worship at home via the live stream on Facebook. Uh, we believe that the Lord wants us to be good neighbors and members of our community. So we're going to follow strict cleaning protocols. It is a lot. It's a, it's a lot of work, but we're going to do it because we love you and we want to make sure that we're all safe. And then also for a season, we're going to greet one another without hugs or handshakes while inside our facility. And I know this is going to be a little bit tricky, but we're going to try to maintain social distancing and greet one another uh, by waving and, I don't know, other creative ways that we can say hi. We're going to practice social distancing. Uh, I mentioned that the wearing of face masks is recommended but not required. And we encourage you, if you're sick, if you've got underlying medical conditions, or if you know that you've been exposed to someone with, with COVID-19, that we recommend that you worship from home. Here's the biggest thing that I want you to get out of this, is that we believe the Lord wants us to honor one another. Paul in Romans 12.10 says, be devoted, tenderly, be devoted to tenderly loving your fellow believers as members of one family. Try to outdo yourselves in respect and honor of one another. So we are going to not label those that meet in person as indifferent towards the health of others. And also we're not going to label those who join in the parking lot or online as fearful or faithless. We're going to honor one another regardless of where we choose to worship because we love one another and we believe that God has called us to, to worship in whatever way we're most comfortable with. So whatever you choose, we love you. We're so thankful for continuing to worship with us. Uh, some in the world have been given to angry factions at this moment. Just jump on Facebook for 30 seconds and you'll probably see that. But here at Hillside, we're not going to let the enemy use this as an opportunity to divide us. We're going to use this as an opportunity to unite us under what Jesus is doing. If you have any questions or concerns about uh, our position and our plan, please contact any of the elders at Hillside, and we would love to talk with you through this. Uh, one final thought with this is that this storm is going to pass, my friends. Jesus will be glorified, and there will be no end to the increase of his government or of his peace. May the Lord use this time to draw us closer to him, to one another, and to the mission of reaching the lost. We are looking forward to continuing being with you, either online or in person. So that's, that's our plans for reopening. Again, if you have any questions, please contact one of the elders. Feel free to contact me. And we're so excited to welcome you back in the building on Sunday, June 7th. All right, a couple other things. We just want to encourage you that during this time of prayer and fasting to join in with what the Lord is saying to the church. We're sending it out via email. It's also going up on Facebook. And I want to encourage you. I know it's hard during this time. Some of you have said, what am I going to give up? I've given up so much already. And I believe that the Lord wants to use this time not just to give something up, but to get something out of it. And I believe that he wants to use this to draw us closer to one another. I was talking to a friend this week who said that same thing. I've given up so much, I don't know what to do. And one of our elders is his friends, and, and he wisely said, well, maybe the Lord is calling you to gather together with the corporate body even more. And it's so easy um, to be able to connect with the Lord in many different ways. There's great sermons and great worship, and version makes it easy to read Bible plans with friends, and all those things are great. But there's nothing like being connected to the local body. And so I want to encourage you that consider that a part of what the Lord wants to do in this time, is to draw us together and to speak the same thing to all of us. So I would even suggest that you consider taking what the Lord is speaking through the devotionals and texting a few friends every day and saying, what's the Lord speaking to you out of this? Well, here's what I'm going to do. Here's what I hear the Lord saying, and here's what I'm going to do. Use it as a time to draw us closer together. I uh, want to also let you know that our virtual meetings are continuing, that we've got worship with Andy on Monday and with the Gearhearts on Friday and Saturday with Abby and I. If you caught it online, we were in a van down by the river last night. If you know that joke, then you know it. Um, it was a lot of fun. So continue joining us for worship to fix your heart on the Lord during this time. And prayer with Patty is still happening on Tuesday nights at 630. What a great opportunity while we're praying and fasting to pray with the church body. So we'd love to have you join with Patty uh, on Tuesday nights for prayer. A couple more things is thank you for giving during this time. We so appreciate your faithful giving to the Lord. God's been faithful to us, and uh, it's a joy to be able to give back to him. So you can give through mail. You can mail it to 807 State Street, Millersburg, PA. You can give online through our website, or you can text any amount of number from $1 to $10 million to 84321, uh, and that'll come directly to us. 
two more things I want to share with you is that tomorrow it's Memorial Day. I know people will be gathering together for parties and for picnics and things like that, but we still have our food delivery going on. That's going to happen at 12 noon. So if you know people, please spread the word far and wide that we have that going on. And I have to tell you that some of our friends from other churches have seen what God's been doing, and they said, we wanted to come along and partner with you. And so we want to make sure that you can do this from now until the end of June. So some of our friends from the other churches in the area have contributed financially. They're going to be contributing volunteers so we can continue doing this. Can I tell you that the reputation in our community is changing from that church, swinging from the chandeliers, which we don't even have, to that church that's known as, as helping people in the community. Praise God for that. So spread the word about that tomorrow. And that's my last announcement, but I want to introduce our guest speaker this morning. Pastor Lakita Gilmore is with us. She is a pastor down at Christ Community. She's a teacher, a mentor. She's a community advocate. She's been doing this for 21 years, I think. You don't look old enough to have been doing this for 21 years, but she's a friend of the house, and we're so excited to have her. Would you welcome, wherever you are, give a warm hillside welcome to Lakita as she comes. Thank you so much. I will tell you, I so enjoyed worship this morning. If you did not get a chance and you're just clicking on now, you need to make sure after the message that you go back and listen to the worship. I was so blessed, um, Abby, I was undone on the floor. So if my mascara looks bad, don't make fun of me. Um, we were just in the presence of God. And so I'm so excited to be with you in your living rooms, in your kitchen. Some of you are probably still in the bed and that's okay. <laughs> Because you're watching church and so um, I'm just excited to be I've always been a friend love the family here at Hillside and I've been watching you guys on social media and Facebook and what you're doing in the community and the food bank and giving out food it's just amazing you're really making an impact um, with the people um, in your community and how you serve so your generosity and giving your generosity and volunteering is making a difference and it's being seen um, all over. So I just bless you with that. And so I, I just wanna start off with prayer um, because I do believe that God has a message um, for all of you. I will tell you, I was in um, the pre-service prayer this morning and between the pre-service prayer and also the worship this morning, the message was already preached. It was already preached. And I was just in awe of God saying, your confirmation of what is needed and what your people need to hear today is totally relevant. And so I don't take it for granted to be able to stand in this place to talk to you right where you are to tell you what God has for you today. So God, we just thank you. I thank you for every single person that's watching, every single person that's listening. God, and I ask that you bless them wherever they are in their walk for those that have been saved and serving you for 20 years, and for those that may not know you yet. God, I ask that you talk to them personally today, that you fill them in every way. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, so the word that I got when I was studying and praying, and I was like, God, okay, so what do you have for your people today? And the Lord clearly said that he wanted you to know, don't come out empty, come out full. So I'm going to say that again. Don't come out empty, but come out full. It's God's plan and intention for us to always come out full. And so I always like to look at definitions and I want to know, okay, what does that word mean? Sometimes we think we know the definition of a word, right? So I looked up full and full means this, containing or holding as much or as many as possible having no empty space. God wants us to come out of every situation, a trial or situation, struggle. He wants us to come out full, meaning there's no empty space. And so what does he want us to be full of? The Lord said he wants us to be full of wisdom. He wants us to be full of faith. And he wants us to be full of power. And I heard those words today in prayer. I heard those words today in the songs that we were singing. And so, you know, we constantly hear some of the sayings that, um, you know, God won't put more on you than you can bear, right? Or sometimes we hear people say, well, he's always working things out for our good. We hear those, but sometimes in the middle of a situation, we don't feel that. We don't feel confident in that scripture. If that's you, that you've ever felt that way at home, even raise your hand, right? 
we felt that. I can tell you I've felt that. And so how do we reconcile? How do we take our feelings, right? And how do we line up our feelings with the word of God? How do we not be controlled by our feelings, the feelings of fear, the feeling that God won't take care of us? We've all been there, that we feel like, God, you're not going to come through. I feel like you're not going to come through. I don't see you working. I don't see you moving. I think that's one of the most important things about that song, Waymaker. I love that song, Waymaker, right? Even when I don't feel it, you're moving. Even when I don't see it, you're moving. And so I believe that even in this season that God is challenging us to come into alignment with his word even more. Because how many of you know we are being tested, right? I believe the body of Christ has, is being tested even right now. And so I will tell you when... Um, we first, when the pandemic happened and they were like, okay, everybody's got to go home. You know, there was an adrenaline rush with me. I will tell you that. There was an adrenaline rush. It was like, okay, you got to get groceries. You got to get this. You get, so you're preparing. So it's just, you don't really have time to think, right? You're just in like a survivor mode, you know? We're thinking about all these TV shows that we've watched before. And you're like, that's us. We're in this show. And so you're getting things all prepared. Well, a little bit of time after that, I went through this season of quietness. And sometimes quietness can be a little scary. And I'll tell you why. I'm a busy person. I like to be doing a lot. I believe that God's called me to be um, productive. But I also have to make sure that I'm not overproductive, right? That I'm following the leading of the Spirit. And so what happened was things started going off my calendar and it got quiet. And so there was a moment, there was a time there that I was like, okay, God, what are you doing? What do I do now when it doesn't feel like I have a lot to do? What is that time going to be filled with? So I started thinking, okay, I should do this. I should do this. You, I saw people on social media, they're cleaning out their garages. They're cleaning, like everybody was doing all this stuff. And I'm like, God, I need to have something to say that I came out of COVID and I did this. I told my family, I was like, we need to get this basement done, right? Because you're, you're thinking there's something productive that I need to do. And so there was a period of time when it was so quiet, and I asked God, I was like, God, what are you doing? What are you saying in this season? What do you want me to know? And while others were, were saying, you know, this is the reason for this, he didn't give me a reason for this, but he did say this to me. He said, I'm concerned with our reactions and our responses. What is your reaction? What is your response? As a believer, how are you responding? We see a lot of response all over the place, right? Through social media, through Facebook. Um, Pastor James is just talking about it, right? We see so many different things, but the Lord is asking you personally, what is your response? What has your response been? If you could turn, if you have your Bibles or online, um, if you can go to James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. Um, so even in that, after that adrenaline and that quiet and the Lord said, what is your response? What is your reaction? He gave me this, um, this text. It's a familiar text. We know this, James 1, 2 through 4. And I'm looking at it through the message Bible. So if you have that, it's really good. And James says this, consider it a sheer gift, friends, when tests and challenges come at you from all sides, right? All sides. If it's not one thing, what do we say? It's another, right? He said, look at those. Consider it a sheer gift. You know that under pressure, your faith life is forced into the open and it shows its true colors. Your faith life under pressure will show its true colors. Earlier, um, Abby sung a song about um, um, making um, new wine, right? And the pressure that grapes are placed to make wine, right? We also talk about um, in the church, olives and olive oil. And so I truly believe even through this text that what is in you when pressure comes, it's gonna come out of you. If it's love that's in you under pressure, love's gonna come out. If it's faith that's in you under pressure, that's what's gonna come out. If it's disbelief under pressure, that's what's going to come out. And I'm not saying this to make you feel bad because if you're in that situation, because I will tell you, God's got a remedy for this. So don't get discouraged and be like, well, that's me, right? What's coming out of me right now is fear. It's not faith. God has a remedy for it. 
His blood is the remedy. His grace, his faithfulness, how much he loves us, it is the remedy for even this. But in the scripture, it says that it's brought, it's forced into the open. It shows its true colors. So don't try to get out of anything prematurely. Let it do its work so you can become mature and well-developed, not deficient in any way. God's purpose is that we will always be full, never empty, never empty. It's not his plan. It's not his, his ploy to see how much we can get out, out of um, or so much pressure will be on us that we come out empty or we come out with nothing. That is not God's plan. It's not his intention. He always wants us to come out full. Even when we're saying counted as a sheer gift or in some translations is counted as a joy. And some of us, we're always concerned about happiness, right? I don't feel happy. Well, happiness and joy are two different things. Happiness is only determined on what's happening. Joy is a choice that despite the situation, that no matter what I'm walking through or going through, I am going to remain joyful. I'm going to have that perspective. I'm going to have a different perspective. I'm going to have a heavenly perspective. That is what God is calling us to. And so I believe that there's principles in the scripture that can help us, even when we're discouraged, even when we don't feel the scripture, where we don't feel it, where I know this is right, but I don't feel it. There's still a remedy for that. And I want to talk about that today. And so here's a person in the Bible I really want to talk about who in the scripture where it talks about if it's not one thing, it's another, it's another, it's another, it's Job. And I tell this to people all the time. Do not look at the Bible as Bible stories. They are not Bible stories. They're not kid stories. These are real accounts of real people who've walked through real situations, but the hand of God was on them. They chose to trust. A lot of them made some horrible mistakes, but God was faithful. He was with them. He forgave them. And so we just get to see part of their life. Now, some of us, if our lives were, you know, put in a book for people to read and judged <laughs> forever and ever, but we need to look at them as these are examples that we can follow. These are people who walk through real life situations. And so I want you to turn to Job with me. Job is someone in the Bible, even Job 1 and 1, it says this. There was a man in the land of Oz whose name was Job. And I'm sorry, land of Uz, not Oz. <laughs> Let me correct that, right? And that the man was blameless, upright, fearing God and turning away from evil. He was a great man, right? So if we would look at him today, he would be like, everybody would be like, oh, that's Job. He's amazing. He's a great dad. He's a great husband. He had probably coached softball. Everybody loved him. He was this amazing man. He was probably, you know, one of the elders or pastors of the church. He was this amazing example. You would never, ever think, right, this man would experience the, the issues that he would be faced with. But there was a conversation that the enemy had with God, and the enemy said, this man, even though he has all of this, he only is serving you, God, because he has all of this. If all of this was taken away, he wouldn't serve you. Think about that. If all of this was taken away, his livelihood, he wouldn't serve you. So God is like, hey, he's my servant, Job. God knew what was in Job. That's what I love about God. So even though um, Job was allowed to go through this situation, this horrible situation in his life, God knew what was deposited already in Job. So if you go to Job 1, um, and look, we're going to look at verses 13 and 22. So this great man, right, great father, great husband, um, in verse 13, it says, Now on the day when his sons and his daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house, a messenger came to Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the donkeys feeding beside them, and the Sabaeans attacked and took them. They also slew the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another also came and said, The fire of God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them. And I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another also came and said, The Chaldeans formed three bands and sword, 
and I alone escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another also came and said, your sons and your daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And behold, a great wind came from across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house, and it fell on the young people and they died. And I alone have escaped to tell you. Then Job arose and tore his robe and shaved his head and he fell to the ground and he worshiped. He lost everything. His response, his reaction was worship. And he said this, naked I came from my mother's room and naked I shall return there. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Job worshiped his response, his reaction. And here's the thing, it was his first response. It was his first reaction. You talk about like someone comes in the room and tells you this, this happened and then someone else, while they're still telling you all these catastrophes, catastrophes everything hit Job all at one time. He lost his businesses, businesses, his livelihood. He lost his family, he lost his children. And his first reaction was to worship. I'm gonna ask you this question, what's your first reaction? When we respond and when we're walking through a trial or a, or a situation, what's your first reaction? And again, this is not to condemn you, this is to help to grow us, to challenge us, to say when faced with opposition, this is what I've learned and this is what I can put into practice. My friend Job, he did this, he put it into practice and God blessed him, right? We can see other examples in the scripture. And so Job's wife, though, she had a different response. She had a different reaction in um, chapter 2, verse 9 through 10. Then his wife said to him, do you still hold fast to your integrity? She says, curse God and die. But he said to her, you speak as a foolish woman speaks. Shall we indeed accept good from God and not accept adversity? And all this, Job did not sin with his lips. And so if you continue to read on, though, in the scripture with Job, Job has three friends. I guess we could call them friends or maybe associates because they weren't that friendly, <laughs> we see in the scripture. But they came to Job and they saw his, the issues that he was going through, right? He had lost all of his businesses. He had lost his children. And then later on, his body was stricken. He had boils all over his body because the enemy then said, well, God, he's still serving you now, but I guarantee you if I touch his body, if I make him sick, he won't serve you. So he did that. So here now he's in pain. It's so funny, I asked my, my 11-year-old son, I was like, how long was Job suffering for? And so he's trying to, you know, what you do? What does a kid do when they need to ask a question? They ask who? Google, that's right, <laughs> they ask Google. So he couldn't find, he saw days, he saw weeks, there was nothing in the scripture that said the length of time that Job was sick for. But I said, what is his response throughout this whole period of time? And so his friends came and they talked to him. And at that time, if you were having this type of experience, that had to have meant you made God angry. He's mad at you. There's something you've done, there's a hidden sin or there's something going on that has made him angry and this is why you're experiencing this. And so even sometimes as believers, if we walk through situations, we will try to evaluate ourselves the same way. There's no way a good person, there's no way a good tither, there's no way someone who's a volunteer who's faithful that they should be experiencing this. But just like Job, we are not exempt from life. We're not exempt from life, but what we do have as believers is the assurance that God will work all things out together for our good. We do have the assurance that he will always bring us out on top. We do have the assurance that we walk in victory. So where others may feel hopeless as a believer in Christ, we have victory so we can walk in that. That's what we have. So even if we walk through a situation that seems so hard and it seems like we can't make it, God is like, oh, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. And he is not a liar. He always tells the truth. He is truth. So we can count on that and we can rely on that. 
So these friends were trying to come to Job and tell him, there must have been something that you've done wrong. And even in the scriptures, we later find out Job got down on himself, right? He didn't curse God, but he did say, why was I born? He did ask those questions, right? He did get to those, that place of like agony. So no one's saying he didn't experience agony and he didn't ask questions and that, okay, so as a Christian, you can't feel that. That's not at all what we're saying. But what he knew was the confidence of God and he relied on that. That is what God knew what was in Job. That's why I believe he was allowed to go through this situation because God knew what was already in Job. God knows what's in you. Don't even think that this test, this trial, even the situation that you're in right now, you may say, well, Kita, you know, I, I've, I'm not working right now. Guess what? God's faithful. He is. You may say, you know, I'm not able to be with all of my family and friends and, and, and I'm hurting because I'm isolated or I'm by myself. God is faithful. He is but you have to trust him. You have to rely on him. I challenge you to worship him. There have been times that I have walked through seasons of my life and the only thing I could do is cry. And the agony and the pain, and you know what I decided to do? I'm crying, I might as well worship, <laughs> right? I might as well worship. And then when I go into a place of worship and I say, God, you're good no matter what. And sometimes it may just only be that to say, God, you're good no matter what. And you may not be a good singer, and that's okay. Because he's not looking for a perfect pitch. He's not looking for a perfect voice. What he's looking is for a heart that will say, God, I will serve you no matter what. And he's faithful. He will come. He will rescue you. He will provide for you. So again, what does he want us to be full of, even coming out of every single trial, every single tribulation, every single challenge? He wants us to be full of wisdom, faith, and power. One of the things that I love about the story of Job is that even though he went through this, and even though his friends you know, um, actually challenged him, making him believe that he must have done something wrong, that God would allow this to happen to him, Job still stayed consistent. He still stayed consistent. And God saw that. God saw that. And in um, chapter 42, I love this, 42 in chapter, chapter 42 of Job, verse 10 through 13, it says, the Lord restored the fortunes of Job when he prayed for his friends. How many of you know that sometimes people in your life, if they rub you the wrong way, you may not always want to pray for them. Anybody at home ever felt like you had some people, they ain't on my prayer list. <laughs> you go on this list, right? Or we got a specific prayer for those people, right? Our prayer is, Lord, help them to get saved. Help them to know their awful, wicked ways, right? Not what God wants, how God wants us to pray for people. How should we pray for our enemies? Do we say, God, bless them? Bless their household. Bless their kids. Make them prosperous and successful. No. Sometimes we want, we want judgment. Anybody, let's just be honest. Anybody at home ever want judgment on someone who's done something wrong to you? Yeah, right? But God is like, that's not the heart that I want you to have. I want you to have my heart. You pray for those who wrongly accuse you. You pray for those who talk about you and treat you bad. That's what you do. And guess what happens? Because I've had to do this. What I've noticed is that my heart actually changed for the person. Then it became easy to pray for them, right? And then when you saw them, it wasn't a big deal, right? Because one of the things that we have to know is we don't fight against flesh and blood. We fight against the enemy. I was telling Abby earlier, you know, there's so much of noise, there's so much of division that it made me so mad the other day. Like I was, I was, I was mad, right? And I had to think about that. And the Lord was like, who are you mad at? Make sure you're mad at the right thing, right? You can't be mad at people. But I was mad at the enemy that he tries to cause division and not just division just in the world, right? But even division amongst believers. And God is saying, what is your reaction? What is your response? 
And our response needs to be the first thing, just like Job did, worship. God, what are you saying? I want to hear from you, not about God, what, uh, you know, I need this, I need this, I need this, I need you to do this. But God, what are you saying? What is your heart? That's what God is challenging us and calling us to. So he wants us to be full, full of wisdom, faith, power. Don't come out in lack of anything. And that's what I believe God's calling us to, to be full. So how do you do that? How do you come out full, right? You're like, Keita, I've lost things. In any situation, not even just now, but in the past, you may have gone through situations like, like I lost, right? That's not God's intention, his heart. But how can we make sure that we come out of every situation full? There's a couple of things I want to say. The first one is you got to know the end from the beginning. You have to know the end from the beginning. Romans 8, 28 says this, Meanwhile, the moment we get tired and waiting, God's spirit is right alongside helping us along. If we don't know how to pray, it doesn't matter. He does our praying in and for us, making prayer out of our wordless sighs and our aching groans. He knows us far better than we know ourselves. He knows our pregnant conditions. Well, when I saw that, I was like, whoa. So God, are you saying because you know what's inside of us, you believe that the pressure right, that we're being placed on or the pressure that we're being placed under is going to birth something? He knows our pregnant condition. You have to know the end at the beginning. There's something in you that God wants to birth out. There's something in you that God wants to either duplicate or produce in the earth. And he says, but you're going to have to experience pressure. You're going to have to sometimes experience loss. And when you have the right perspective, right, it will birth something. He knows our pregnant conditions. You're pregnant. <laughs> you are pregnant. And when you're pregnant, your hips hurt, ladies. You, you know, like different parts of your body hurts and, and you feel uncomfortable. And, you, and sometimes you're like, when is this baby going to come? Right towards the end, you're like, come on, it's time to deliver. But God says, don't try to do anything prematurely. Let it have its perfect work. You're pregnant. So don't look at this situation or where you're at and say, oh my goodness, woe is me. Just say, I'm pregnant. I'm pregnant. When your friends are complaining and they're having a hard time and they just can't um, wrap their heads around what they're going through, just tell them, you're pregnant. Even for the guys, tell them, you're pregnant, <laughs> right? He knows our pregnant condition and he keeps us present before God. That's why we can be so sure that every detail in our lives of love for God is worked into something good. This is why. So you got to know the end at the beginning. The next one is don't look for a quick fix. James, earlier we talked about um, not trying to get out of anything prematurely, right? I'm going to tell you this. So um, I love to apply the word, or if I learn something, I will apply it right away. I'm a quick learner, right? So I, I did that with God, too, for a period of time. I was like, okay, if I would go through a situation, I'd be like, okay, so what are you trying to teach me? What are you trying to teach me right now? Let's hurry up. I'm going to learn this, what you need me, me, need me to do, and then I'm going to get out of the situation. How many of you know that that did not work out too well with God? Like, for me telling him, this is my time limit on my trial. Um, this, is when I, this is the exit plan, Right? <laughs> Like I was going to put a copyright on it because that's probably what would have happened, right? Because I'd be like, this is the perfect formula. This is how you get out of your trial within 30 days. It would be a book. 30 days, this is how you get out of a trial. God is like, not. I have the perfect timetable. I know what you need, right? So what is God trying to work out in you? If you're still in the heat of something, ask God, what is it that you're trying to work in me? that maybe hasn't been developed yet. Or maybe it's not time for delivery, but you're trying to still instill in me faith, perseverance, endurance, right? So I think that's important. Don't look for a quick fix. And then the last one is believe boldly. 2 Corinthians 5, 7 through 8 says this. That's why we live with such good cheer. I love this in the message translation. 
You won't see us dropping our heads or dragging our feet. Cramped conditions here don't get us down. Imagine if we said that as believers. These conditions ain't going to get us down. They only remind us of the spacious living conditions ahead. It's what we trust in. But don't you see that keeps us going? Do you suppose a few ruts in the road or rocks in the path are going to stop us? When the time comes, we'll be plenty ready to exchange exile for homecoming. God's got something big in store for you, but he wants us to believe big, to believe boldly. Again, I believe that if you, in your current situation, wherever you are, if you say, God, these are the the things that I'm going to do right now. I'm going to know the end from the beginning. I'm not going to look for a quick fix, and I'm going to believe boldly. I believe that God will do something in your life miraculous. And you may say, well, I'm on E right now. That, That could be really true for a lot of people. Like, you're talking about being full, Kita, but I don't feel full. I feel like I'm on E, maybe half of a tank, and it depends on the day. Sunday, I may be closer to full. Monday, Tuesday, I'm getting down to E. God doesn't want us to get down to E. He wants us to have a continuous flow with him. But how do we get to full? We get to full by believing he has the best plans for us. He's never going to leave you. He's never going to forsake you. And you may say, well, I think we're going into week 11. I think, is this week 11, I think? Or week 10? Week 11. I don't even know. We're keeping track. Week 11, right? And you're like, but I haven't done anything. I didn't clean out my basement. I didn't do this. You know, all those things. It's not too late. Not for the basement. I'm not talking about that. But it's not too late to ask God, what is it that you want to do in this season? It's not wasted. Don't get down and discourage on yourself thinking, hey, I didn't put in a lot of time with the Lord during this time. Maybe I was so discouraged and fear crept in that I didn't read my Bible that much or I didn't worship that much or I relied more on the news than I relied on God's word. I don't want you to feel condemned at all. I want you to know that God is with you right now, right now where you are. And he says, I can redeem the time. There's no time with God. He can redeem the time. So I don't want you to get discouraged by that. And these are two scriptures that I just want to pray over you quickly, right, that you come out full. Colossians 1 and 9 says this, For this reason also, since the day we heard of it, we have not ceased to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Ephesians 3 and 16 says this, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man. So I want to pray with you now. So right where you are, in your house, right where you are, wherever you are, if you're in your car, if you're driving, um, I want you to know this. God is faithful and he loves you and he wants the best for you. And he knows what's in you, your pregnant condition. He knows that. There is no thing, no thing that you will have to face alone. Don't believe the lie of the enemy because he will come. Don't believe the lie that you're in isolation. Don't believe the lie that God won't come through for you. Don't believe the lie that he, that God will leave you. Don't believe the lie that you're facing this situation because there's something you've done wrong. You need to just tell him no. Like you just got to, sometimes you just got to just be really mad. Remember I talked about I was so mad and angry. You got to make sure that your anger is turned towards the enemy. It's not to people. And then you get the heavenly perspective that God has for you. And that you can do all things through Christ who gives you strength. So I'm going to pray for you today, right where you are, that you will come out full, full of wisdom, full of strength, full of power. That's what he has for you. That's your pregnant condition. So right now, if you could even put your hands out, like I want you to put your hands out like you're receiving a gift. And you may say, well, that seems goofy because I'm in my house. How many of you know right now your houses have become churches? We are the church, the ecclesia, not the building, you. 
So wherever you are, the presence of God is there. Wherever you are, even if you're not at home and you step out on the street corner, the presence of God is with you there. You are more, okay, I'm sorry. You are more powerful than you think you are. Don't let the enemy try to make you think that you're only powerful when you're in a building. And it's going to be a great time when we gather together in church as it is. But don't be fooled because this is what I want people to believe. I don't want us to come back into churches and it's, it's as normal again. Like we want to go back to normal. No, let's, let's go the way God wants us to go. And what it was was maybe he said, I want the church to be mobile. I want you to know that wherever you go, I'm going to be with you. I'm not going to leave you. I'm not going to forsake you. Wherever you go, you can lay hands on the sick and they will recover. Maybe that's what God was doing. So don't just get it twisted, as the young people would say. Is that, <laughs> that, do they still say that? No, I'm sorry. I just found out they don't say that anymore. Don't get it wrong. Let me go back to being 45. Don't get it wrong and think that there wasn't some type of purpose in this. That God won't work it out for us. So hands out, because you're in your church right now. God, I just thank you for every single person that's watching. God, I pray for those that feel like they're on E and they feel depleted. I speak to their souls right now and just declare your heavenly angels will go right to them to encourage them. God, build them up, give them strength, help them to know that you will never leave them nor forsake them. Help them to understand and know that God, that you're going to provide them the strength that they need. So right now, we come against the enemy. Every single negative thought that has tried to control your feelings and have tried to control your thought patterns. A friend of mine said, don't allow the enemy to live in your mind rent free. Kick him out. So we declare that in Jesus' name. God, my friends that feel like they're half full, God, I just say fill them up more, God. Give them the desire to want to study and to want to worship you, that our first reaction will not be disgust or, or being upset, but our first reaction will be to worship and hear from you. And God, those that feel like I am full, I ask that you give them supernatural strength to, strength to evangelize more than ever before, that they will come and encourage people and bring people together, that God, that they will create unity. So right now, God, I just declare that we all will walk in fullness of wisdom. We will increase in our fullness of faith, and we will walk in power. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Wakita. That was awesome. Uh, just a thought from my notes. Well, I'm curious, what's your takeaway? I'd love to hear what is it that you felt like the Lord was speaking to you through this message this morning. I love that picture from Romans 8 from the message about how we're pregnant with something. Never thought about that before. But I did think, you know, what's really weird is when people are pregnant and they don't even know it. I've heard stories like this before. I don't know how it happens, but women like get to their delivery date and they had no idea they were pregnant. And here's the thing is that God wants to do something in this moment. One of the best things you can do right now is talk to a couple of people that you trust, talk to some trusted friends and say, you know what, this is what I think the Lord is trying to birth in me through this season. I don't want you to miss out from it. So I would encourage you to take some time this week, maybe even today, before you go and do the next thing and share with someone, what is it that God's trying to speak? What is it that God wants to birth through me? And I want to pray for you. What is it that God wants to birth through you too? So thank you, Pastor Lakita, for, for sharing that with us. And I just want to encourage you that if you've been as blessed by today's message as we have, uh, you're welcome to give in the love offering for Lakita. There's a couple ways you can do it. You can give online through the web address that's on the screen, or you can text any amount to that number again, 84321, uh, and just make sure that you put love-offering in, and that will go to Lakita. We'll get it to her as a love offering. So Lakita, thank you so much for being with us this morning. Friends, thank you for joining us wherever you are, and I look forward to being with you next week and even more on June 7th. We love you. Have a great week. We'll see you soon.